This is going to be a long one. Analog horror has got to be one of the best things to come out of the horror genre in the last decade or so. Taking off from the found footage tropes that we see through web series such as Marble Hornets and movies such as The Blair Witch Project, it's really expanded and become its own horror genre, so much so that series have become popular in the last few years, capitalizing off of the analog horror subgenre. Such series include The Mandela Catalog, Monument Mythos, Gemini Home Entertainment, Local 58, and the list goes on and on. There's so many great ones, and a lot of them have been covered extensively here on YouTube, especially by YouTubers such as Wendigoon or Nightmind. But there are a lot of analog horror series that I feel don't get enough recognition. One of which, and the subject of today's video, will be the criminally underrated Winter of 83. Winter of 83 was made by YouTuber Linkara atop the fourth wall, and it was released on April 1st, 2022. Yeah. This whole series was basically made as an April Fool's joke. There's not a lot of other horror content on this channel or anything. Just they decided to make an analog horror on a whim, release all 15 parts in one day, and call it done. And the work they put into it really shows. Although this was uploaded on April 1st, and the last thing we see is an April Fool's Day card in the very last episode, the quality of this series is really good, and it's one of the best examples of analog horror that I feel is not appreciated enough. So today, we are going to be looking at Winter of 83, all 15 episodes of it, and then the timeline at the end that really breaks down the events that happened. So today's video is probably going to be a longer one, so I'm going to go ahead and thank you for sticking around and watching it. Without further ado, let's get into analyzing the episode by episode. Segment 1 is titled End of Broadcast Day. The Winter of 83 series begins by telling us that in January of 1983, the entire town of Fawn Circle, Minnesota disappeared. This informs us that all the following footage that we're going to see throughout the series was collected as an investigation to see what happened to the townsfolk and why they disappeared. While much of the footage and audio recordings found were damaged, the investigators have done their best to put in order the events that transpired on that January of 1983. The first real bit of footage that we see having been collected is from K83FM, a local news station which, for the majority of this video, we'll be referring to as Channel 83, as that is what the residents of Fawn Circle refer to it as throughout the series. Channel 83 is signing off for the night at midnight. The broadcast day is over, hence the title of this segment. It goes through normal footage of the national anthem playing and showing various patriotic shots. We see images such as the Constitution, the Founding Fathers, until the footage begins to distort. It shows an abandoned car, bloody snow, and various other found footage type shots that were clearly not meant to be in the initial broadcast. Not the one that Channel 83 had prepared for, anyways. The footage cuts out completely until it finally cuts back to two scientists in a lab of some sort. They're very distressed and seem wounded. They're pleading for help for anyone that'll listen, saying that they're stuck in the basement of Scott's Manor. They say that they're either going to freeze to death or be buried alive as something off camera knocks them down and ends the broadcast. And that is the end of segment one. Segment two is titled Police Investigation of Scott's Manor. This entry follows three characters, Vivian Reynolds, Greg Semi. These two are videographers for Channel 83. They are accompanied by Sheriff Douglas. One thing I implore this series on doing well is building up a world that's actually believable. There's some banter at the beginning of this episode between Vivian and Greg that isn't really important to the series at all. They're just talking about making sure the cap is off the camera and making sure that it's on or off and the mic's on or off. Stuff like that as they say instances like that have happened before. Recording now. Are you sure? I don't want it to be like last week where the cameraman forgot to turn the mic on and we recorded an interview for half an hour before they noticed. I'm positive levels and readings here. There's nothing creepy about this at all. This doesn't allude to anything going further. It is simply just showing that these two characters have a work history together and that they're prone to making mistakes. Stuff like that really helps make this world seem alive and makes it all the more tragic that we know going through this that they're not going to make it. As we learned in segment one, the entirety of Fawn's circle disappears. The two Channel 83 employees begin talking to Sheriff Douglas and kind of interviewing him, which acts as exposition for us. We learn that Scott's Manor used to be the mayor of Fawn Circle's house, 
Although it was the mayor's house for many years, it closed for renovations in 1968. Sheriff Douglas says that last September, the University of Minnesota had some scientists rent it out to run experiments. Basically, the deal was they help renovate the house and update it as it's been abandoned for quite some time, and then they get to use the space to do their experiments. The reporters ask if there's anything really special about the place. The sheriff says there's some calls and urban legends that the place is haunted, but he doesn't quite believe that, saying that the real reason it was abandoned was simply because it was too expensive to keep up with the renovations after all those years, and that for being the mayor's house, it was 20 minutes outside of town. So it just wasn't practical, and that's why it was abandoned. Nothing to do with ghosts. We learned that the reason the three of them are heading out to Scott's Manor is because of the hijacking that took place the night before. This is what we saw in segment one with the scientists begging for help, saying they were trapped in Scott's Manor. The reason the Channel 83 reporters are going is one, to get the inside scoop on what's going on, and two, because the signal hijacking actually came from their station. They were basically sent to get to the bottom of this, as well as the sheriff is there to see if anyone's harmed. The three of them are talking on the ride up, at which point Greg shares that the station is not doing too well, and that if Channel 83 does not receive a stimulus from the city, it's likely that it'll close down. The trio finally arrives to Scott's Manor. We get an exterior shot of Scott's Manor, and the place is run down. Windows are broken, allowing snow to blow in from outside, and doors are off their hinges. The paint's still peeling on the outside, and the place just overall has a sense of being abandoned, regardless of the fact that scientists have been working there for the last four months. When this is brought up to Sheriff Douglas, he shares that he was just by recently, and that the place looked a lot better than it currently does, meaning something had to happen here. They assume it was a snowstorm as the area has been getting hit by those very frequently, that perhaps broke the windows and caused the snow to come inside. Sheriff Douglas calls for someone named Dr. Chandra. Yelling around the empty house, the only thing he hears in return is the own echo of his voice. No one answers. The three split up to look for clues, like a Scooby-Doo episode, and as you probably guess, this doesn't end well for any of them. Greg heads down to the basement, which if you remember is where the scientists said that they were trapped. He comes down and calls out for anyone, but no one answers. He then opens the door to see that it is somehow snowing on the inside of the basement. And that is the end of segment two. Segment three is titled City Council Meeting. This segment actually takes place on the same day as segment two just did, just later on. As you can guess from the title of this entry, it is a city council meeting for the people of Fond Circle. The main issue at hand being discussed is the oncoming blizzard that is set to hit the town. However, they obviously have other things to take care of as well. During the meeting, the mayor calls for one of the representatives of the University of Minnesota to come up and share how the restoration of Scott's Manor is going. Although the mayor calls for them, they are notably missing from the meeting. It's at this point that text appears on the screen that says they are with us now, referring to the workers of the University of Minnesota and the scientists at Scott's Manor. The next thing on the agenda is discussing Channel 83 and its current state. General Manager Darren Frederick is called up to the stand who requests that the channel be granted a stimulus. He wants $75,000 over the next three months to be precise. It is at the point that Darren comes up to the mic that text appears again. This time it says, we feast upon his work. The mayor almost instantly turns down the request for the stimulus for Channel 83. He goes on to bash their work, saying that it's cheap and crude. The mayor also bashes Darren's ability to manage the place, calling into question the frequent hijackings that have been occurring on Channel 83, again referring to the one we saw in Segment 1, and it seems as though this has been an ongoing issue for the station. While discussing this, one of the city council representatives says that the mayor is requested immediately. There has been a development at Scott Manor, and Sheriff Douglas wants to speak to the mayor urgently. As he says this, text appears once again that says they have embraced us, followed by, and so will you. As the meeting disperses, we hear one of the mics pick up two people talking. This conversation is between videographer Darcy Milbanks and private investigator Carl Denby. We learn that Darcy has contacted Carl to look into the disappearance of her brother. The two set up a time to speak. Excuse me, Darcy Milbanks? Yes? I'm Carl Denby, the private investigator you contacted. You wanted to speak to me about your brother? 
Yes, uh, thank you for coming. I'll be with you in just a moment. I just need to shut down the camera feed and end the audio recording, and I'll be right with you. Alrighty. When you're ready, I do have a few things I can go over already. Segment 4, Late Night Movie, further goes on to show that the mayor was not wrong about the frequent hijackings of Channel 83. We've already seen one, but this shows us that this is a regular occurrence. We see through Channel 83's Up Next that they're supposed to show the classic The Thing from Another World. And while the movie does almost start, it is interrupted once again through one of the broadcast hijackings. This segment follows a woman filming the snowy area for B-roll for someone named Alan. She has a mic set up and is talking about how much she loves the cold outside. <laughs> Speaking of Chris, I love the sound of crunching snow beneath my feet. It's fun. We can also infer that Alan and the unnamed woman have a relationship as the woman says, yes, she would love to spend the rest of her life with Alan. However, she is cut off by noticing that the area in front of her is roped off. It is then that she sees that there are a bunch of footprints on the ground around her, even though she was under the impression that this area was sectioned off for her and Channel 83 to get the footage. She then gasps as she gets alarmingly cold, saying that it felt for just a split second that it was 80 below. She decides, as any good horror story protagonist would, to follow the mysterious footsteps, to which she stumbles upon a snowman that wasn't there before. Wait, where did that... <laughs> Suddenly there's a loud roar that caused her to scream and run away, but she falls down. When she falls down and tries to get back up, her camera is positioned in a way as she's lifting herself up that she can see what appears to be a decaying human face in the snow. The footage then distorts and cuts to blood all over the snow on the ground. Her bloody hand reaches up as though to grasp onto something, and it falls down back into the cold snow. However, the audience is left with one more scare, as the camera is suddenly picked back up. Once again, we can't see who's doing the recording, but we hear the narrator's voice. She begins talking to Alan again, although it becomes very apparent to the viewer that something is horribly wrong. Alan, I'm glad I'm empty. Alan, I love the chill. It's so cold. I'm numb. Spend the rest of your life in winter. I'm so cold. Shiver in all the empty. Share in all the empty. I'm so cold. I'm so cold. I'm so cold. I'm so cold. Her voice is robotic, it lacks any sort of human cadence. It is simply taking what she said before and reconfiguring the words. It appears as though whatever killed her has possessed her in some sort of way, or at the very least, taken her voice. The footage cuts back to the broadcast of The Thing From Another World, showing the credits, as segment 4 draws to an end. Like a lot of analog horror, it's a slow burn. You collect information as it goes on, there's a few scares, but it's nothing in your face. Segment 4 does a very good job of making sure that burn stings as it goes. And it was actually this segment that hooked me, as that last instant where you see the face in the snow followed by the woman's seeming death, and then the camera gets picked up, and you hear that voice, there was something's wrong with it, it's not human anymore. That was what really drew me into the series, and it was that segment 4 where I was like, okay, I'm gonna watch all 15 episodes of this, and I've got to make a video on it. Segment 5 is entirely audio. It is a tape recording from private investigator Carl Denby interviewing Darcy Milbanks. Once again, if you remember these two met at the end of segment 3 at the city council meeting. Carl has been hired to look into the disappearance of Darcy's brother Stephen. Carl is interviewing Darcy to get all of what she knows on tape. That way, if he misses anything or there's anything that could help him, even if it doesn't seem apparent at the time with solving the case, he can just listen to the recording instead of having to ask her all over again and get in touch with her. He shares that this is the second time that they have had this interview. Something happened to the first tape that caused it to distort to the point that it was unusable. This interview is being conducted for a second time. The original interview tape conducted on January 4th has somehow been corrupted and is now unlistenable. Darcy shares all the information she can recall about Stephen. Stephen was hired to help with the renovations at Scott's Manor. Though he has nothing to do with the team of scientists that are working there, he is simply just a carpenter. 
Darcy shares with Carl that Stephen and his girlfriend Stephanie have both been missing for several days now. Darcy said that upon noticing that she hadn't seen her brother in a while, she had to go to Scott's Manor and ask what happened. Scott's Manor doesn't have a working phone, so when Darcy noticed that her brother Stephen had not returned home after some time, she drove out there and asked the workers if they had seen anything or heard from him. They shared that Stephen had showed up, completed his shift, and went home. They hadn't seen him since. This is all of the information that was gathered during Carl and Darcy's first interview. Carl shares that he has obtained some more information since their meeting just the previous day. He believes that he has found Stephen's car. I believe I found your brother's car. It matched the description you gave me, but the license plates were missing. Where? And you didn't find him? Easy, Darcy. Easy. I was on my way to Scott's Manor yesterday to interview them myself when I came across the car along the side of a country road. It had been abandoned, but I didn't find any footprints leading anywhere. Just a lot of snow in the tires, probably from that storm the other day. There was a half-eaten bag of chips in it, but nothing else to indicate who it belonged to. He says that it matches the description of the car that she gave him. However, he can't confirm it as there are no license plates. They have been removed. The car was found abandoned on the side of the road. He tried to call the cops to report it, yet when he called the police station there was no answer. He went to the police station and noted that no one was there. Carl ends by saying that he plans to head to Scott's Manor himself to see what he can't find. So with segment 5, there's a bit more to unpack. I believe that the car that Carl is referring to abandoned on the side of the road is the very same abandoned car on the side of the road buried in the snow that we see in segment 1 during the broadcast hijacking. On top of that, Another thing to unpack here from segment 5 is that none of the police are made available. And we know through the city council meeting entry that Sheriff Douglas needed backup at Scott's Manor. This could be where the police are, but at this point, that's simply speculation. Segment 6 is Sid's Electrical Boutique Commercial. This is a local commercial airing on Channel 83 for Sid's Electrical Boutique. The broadcast starts off normal. We go through the various items for sale at Sid's, until, once again, the signal is hijacked and we see more found footage. This is from an employer of Sid's walking up the store. The cameraman is not happy about this, feeling that if Sid doesn't trust him, he should just install security cameras instead of having him film himself walking up the store every night. He's especially unhappy as the snowstorm has begun hitting the town. The footage begins to cut out as the cameraman hears a voice from behind him asking for help. What they put in this on tape? Why are you gonna do it? Can you help me with this? Hello? He spins around and sees no one there. The voice repeats itself once again asking for help, though this time the cameraman goes to investigate. He walks for a while, searching for the source of the voice, yet is unable to find it, until he stumbles upon a snowman that wasn't there before. It is at this point that the cameraman is attacked from behind and falls to the ground. And all we can hear in the aftermath is the same voice saying thanks for the help, bud. Commercial returns to normal. So it's clear now that the snowmen are a major threat in this series. They seem to just appear out of nowhere, and although this is only the second time that's happened, in both instances, the person who has come across such snowmen has died a presumably very violent death. So we're just going to keep moving along to segment 7, audio recording of Carl Denby. This entry is another one that is completely audio, taken from Carl Denby's tape recorder. This means that we can only hear in this episode, although Carl is exploring Scott's Manor. Carl intended to make it to Scott's Manor the previous day, however, the snowstorm that our cameraman in the last episode was caught in prohibited Carl from doing so, meaning he has to come out today, a day later than he intended. Beforehand, Carl did manage to get in touch with a police officer, one Deputy Blair. However, he is the only police officer left at the station. All other police officers are now missing. Carl finally arrives at Scott's Manor and sees a bunch of police cars outside. He infers that every police officer except Deputy Blair headed to Scott's Manor at Sheriff Douglas's request for backup. All the cop cars appear to be abandoned though, as every single officer went inside of Scott's Manor. Carl enters Scott's Manor expecting to find a bunch of cops or people or something, 
but instead he's left with an interesting scene. There's still snow all over the ground inside of Scott's manor. This time though, there's a bunch of footprints in the snow, dozens of sets moving around in any direction, notably to the basement. On top of that, and more alarmingly, he finds two revolvers, both are empty of all their shots. He finds shredded clothes, and there's blood in the snow. Carl heads down into the basement to discover that it's not a normal basement. The scientists have converted it into a lab with a bunch of metal walls and offices all around down there. On top of that, the snow has made it down there regardless of the fact that there are no windows to blow it in down there and that the basement door was closed. Carl finds a note among the wreckage that says, December 12th, growth rate of organism increases exponentially in colder temperatures. Most alarmingly, he finds human remains in the snow, and there is blood everywhere. Carl goes into an office and finds a cassette tape as well as the camera that the videographers all the way back in segment two had brought down there. He wants to review the footage that they captured, but the camera battery is dead. Someone calls out for help and Carl goes to investigate. He sees that there's a scientist buried in the snow. He says he can't feel his legs. Carl presumes this is from frostbite, but when he tries to pull him out, he sees that the man's legs are completely gone. Can you stand? No, no, my legs are they're buried in the snow. I can't feel them. Don't worry, I'll carry you up, man. Oh my god. I... Man, your legs. Oh god. They're gone, aren't they? Yes. I'm so sorry. Carl offers to help the man out, carry him up to his car, but the man begs for Carl to leave, saying that it's not safe, as though on cue, we hear a voice. Carl begs the voice to help him get the man to safety outside into the car so they can leave and get him help. But when Carl sees the source of the voice, he realizes that it's Stephen, Darcy's brother, the very man he has been hired to come find. As Steven repeats this question, hey, can you help me with this, over and over again, Carl sees that his lips are not moving as he speaks. Hey, can you help me with this? Hey! Come over here and help me with him, man! I need to get him to my car outside! Come on, man, help me here! I... Wait, wait a second, you're, you're Steven Milbanks, aren't you? Your sister hired me to find you. Hey, can you help me with this? How are you talking without your lips moving? Run! Run now! It's not him! No, I got him! But... The scientist screams that that is not Steven anymore and implores Carl to run. Carl hits Steven and runs up the stairs out to leave Scott's manor. As he runs, he hears the scientist yell one thing to him. Get out of here! Warn everyone! They're in the snow! Segment 8 is City Council Meeting 2. This is yet another City Council Meeting a few days after the previous one. Once again, the camera settles on the mayor. Text once again pops up in the bottom that says, We know you well. The mayor notes that he has not heard from the police since they went out to Scott's Manor, but for whatever reason, he's not alarmed by that and thinks that they're all just busy. Or he thinks that it could be an issue with their phones not working, but he says after this meeting, he plans to drive out there himself to the police station and see what's going on. The mayor calls once again for Darren Frederick to come up to the mic to further discuss the Channel 83 stimulus. However, Darren isn't able to attend. Instead, one Melinda Norvik comes as the representative for Channel 83, saying that Darren is unable to be there. As she takes the stand, the text pops up again and says, you will never be alone again. She explains the issue going on with the signal hijackings saying that someone with a stronger transmitter is broadcasting over them and they are unable to simply cut the broadcast as the person with the higher transmitter is now overtaking their broadcast. The mayor doesn't seem satisfied by that answer and once again further just decides to lay into channel 83. But as he's going on about that, the text changes again to now say, these walls you erect cannot hold. We will creep in regardless. Obviously, the people at the town hall meeting are not aware of the text that pops up, so they continue as normal. Norvik goes on to share that not only have the transmissions been weird, 
But whenever the footage is interrupted, the tape that they put into broadcast, when they take that out, it has been permanently rewritten. Meaning that whatever hijacking takes place isn't just overriding the broadcast, it's overriding the tape itself permanently. This shouldn't be possible as no one is recording over the tape, it is simply just being broadcasted over. But regardless, Norbit can't make sense of it and none of the producers at Channel 83 can. After this, the power goes out. While the broadcast is still running, we are left in the dark. People go to leave, but we can hear through what they're saying that snow has completely blocked them in, covering all the doors and windows entirely. At this point, the text changes once again. No escape. All the people are now trapped inside, with no way out. Segment 9, Recovered Many Cassettes 1. This is once again another audio-only one. Carl has made it out of Scott's Manor fine and back to his office. He is now reviewing the audio that he found on the cassettes in the basement of Scott's Manor. However, Carl too is trapped inside of his office due to the blizzard. He tried getting in touch with Darcy, but to no avail, as unbeknownst to him, she is trapped at the city council meeting. He also shares that when he punched Stephen on the way out of Scott's Manor, it didn't feel like punching a human. He said he likely believes that Stephen is dead, though he doesn't make sense of how Stephen was interacting with him. Carl begins to listen to the cassette tapes. While most of them were destroyed or just unlistenable, he found a few that he thinks were important to listen to. The person on the recordings is a Dr. Robert Chandra, the same Dr. Chandra that Sheriff Douglas called out for all the way back in segment two to no answer. However, the strangest part about this is that it is noted to us as viewers that Dr. Chandra has been missing for the last four years. By the way, I'm just gonna throw this out there. As far as I could tell, that's never elaborated on. Um, I could be an idiot and missing something, um, but I've watched this a couple times now, and I have not seen any indication of why Dr. Chandra was a missing person for so long before this. Um, so if you know, if you've seen this, um, if you find the answer, uh, please drop it in the comments. Um, it could have something to do with his research maybe being secretive, um, so he kind of disappeared. But as far as I'm able to tell, there's no concrete answer for this, which is fine. Um, I just want to throw that out there that if you're looking at that for like a big key, uh, it's not as far as I can tell. So the tapes begin here. September 14th, 1982. We know the experiment that he's working on is called Project Freezing Rain. The renovations to Scott's Manor are going well. The lab is being installed perfectly fine. And Chandra sh shares with us that in just a few days time, the specimen will arrive at Scott's Manor. September 17th, they have successfully made contact with the life form. The life form, the specimen, the thing, whatever you want to call it, has been able to communicate with Dr. Chandra verbally. However, doing so is a strain on the life form, so communications have been in very small doses. In the small time that they've been able to communicate, the life form has learned the alphabet and has begun to form sentences. While these are very, like, kindergarten-esque sentences, not real detailed or anything, the simple fact is still this mysterious life form that's simply made up of bacteria is communicating to scientists with our own language. They communicate not just by talking, like, like how I am to the camera right now, but through a text-to-speech modulator. The first transmission they received is this. Hello, you are Dr. Kendra. We are the oh, I hate that. <laughs> That's the end of that first cassette that Carl listens to. We cut back to Carl, who shares that there is a scraping from a branch outside his window. Suddenly, the window breaks, and the tape ends. Damn it, there's a branch from a tree outside, scraping against the window. I'll move to a deeper part of the office away from that. <laughs> Segment 10 is the Medicine Lake Campgrounds infomercial. This is another local broadcast from Channel 83, which is showing the night's schedule. And the Medicine Lake Campgrounds infomercial is on paid programming. Well, going through the various things that you can do at the MLC, especially in the winter, um, the last one it comes up with is Search for Stephen Milbanks. Um, that's probably you know a fun activity for the family. In doing so though, it shows the wrecked car from segment one, which means I was right. That was Stephen Milbanks' car. I think. Probably. 
Uh, but you know, getting off my little high horse there, uh, the music cuts out and it shows uh, blood covering the snow and it simply says bleed is one of the activities you can do. The footage then cuts back to normal for a bit and we can further see the type of cabins that the MLC has for people to stay at. Um, it's going over the various classes of cabin and it goes to the embrace class and it shows a rundown cabin with some lovely features listed such as no windows, no doors, a collapsed roof, no heat, silence, and lastly, no escape. It then, once again, cuts to the outside of Scott's Manor and says, our old home. The next shot is of a bloodied skeleton in the snow that says, our new home. Our new home repeats over and over and over again until it covers the screen completely. The footage returns to normal, though now the logo has a reddish hue to it. The text and slogan changes to, Do you will be like us. Segment 11, City Council Meeting 3. This is very shortly after City Council Meeting 2. We see that they now have emergency power on, though we have no um, footage, as the cameras are rolling to keep in touch with the outside world as the phone lines are down. However, only the footage is recording to try and conserve power. The mayor shares the good news. Like I said, they have the generator working. Um, they have enough food and supplies to last them a couple days, thankfully, but he also has bad news. They aren't able to dig themselves out. There is just too much snow for even everyone crammed in that building to try and dig out. On top of that, everyone's vehicles are buried completely under the snow and likely won't work again, just to add insult to injury. Mrs. Novick of Channel 83's representatives is able to get in touch with her co-workers and in doing so they're going to send an emergency snow plow the station has just to clear their driveway um, and the mayor really does change his attitude about channel 83 which is nice we have some character development and he shares that he will further reconsider their stimulus as they're helping the town out a great deal through bringing the snow plow however very surprisingly to everyone we hear a door open i believe um and detective blair just walks in now, remember, no one was able to get out of the building as they were snowed in completely, and Blair is able to just waltz on in. The man, however, looks very, very disheveled, and it appears as though he has walked the whole way from the police station to the city council meeting through the raging blizzard going on outside. Somehow, he managed to jimmy open a window and climb through. Blair is livid as he's finally begun to figure out what's going on. He screams at the mayor, saying that he sentenced all the cops to their deaths by having them sent to Scott's Manor. He says that the mayor knew that the scientists were working on some experiments there. Darcy asks if anyone knows anything about her brother, to which Detective Blair said if he was at Scott's Manor, he is certainly dead. Blair shares that he was chased all the way from the police station to the city council meeting by things made of snow with human faces. We hear the town murmur in uproar of, the story of the events of everything. And then we hear a door open. And we hear footsteps enter. We hear Darcy call out to the unknown figure who has just walked in. Yelling that it is Stephen. Her brother. Stephen? Stephen! You're alive! No! Get away from him! Stephen! Oh my god! I'm so happy to see you! Where have you been? I've been so worried! That is not Stephen! Look at his arms! They're made of snow! Stephen, I missed you. I... Stephen, say something. Darcy approaches the figure with Stephen's face as Boyer calls out to her that it's not him and to get away from the thing. Something is wrong, though, as we hear Stephen say, Can someone help me with this? As we hear a scream, and then the tape ends. Hey, can you help me with this? What the? Segment 12, Recovered Many Cassettes 2. It is the morning after the previous entries. Carl is thankfully fine. He has moved to another office, and although he is fine for now, the heater is not working quite as well as it should, and he is unable to leave. So he is in a cold, empty office building by himself. He claims to hear tornado sirens outside, as he shares that many of the cassettes were destroyed as the snow billowed into his office. However, he still has a few to listen to, 
and the following is the final contents of the cassettes. December 27th, 1982. Dr. Chandra and his team come back from a Christmas break. They discover that the skeleton crew has learned that the life form has been asking about Dr. Chandra and his team while they were away, as well as asking about what Christmas is. They have also discovered by this point that the life form has the ability to influence and manipulate ultra high frequency bands and magnetic media. The scientists feel that this may act as a form of sustenance for the life form. When they interact with these devices, they're able to create images. They're also able to impact these forms of media physically and permanently. This basically explains what happened in City Council Meeting 2, what Norvik was sharing with everyone. That whenever she took the tape out, the hijacking hadn't only been on the TVs, but it also changed it permanently. The life form calls out to Dr. Chandra as he's recording, and asks to know about his life, his mind, and his blood. Dr. Chandra. Hello again, my friends. Uh, could you wait a moment? I'm trying to finish something. We want to know about you. We want to know about your mind and your thoughts and your blood. It is not like us. Chandra shares that the beings have begun getting stronger. They're able to communicate longer. They're able to manipulate things more. And it is while he's sharing this that we hear a familiar voice in the background. Hey, can you help me with this? Ah, yes, Dr. Matthews. Just a moment. Up until this point, I had thought that that voice belonged to Stephen, Darcy's brother. We now know that this voice belongs to Dr. Matthews, not Stephen. But clearly, this shows that it can wear the face of one thing while using the voice of another. On top of that, snow has begun to appear in the lab. December 30th, 1982. Dr. Chandra is becoming very weary of the life form at this point. Initially, the scientists thought the snow that was appearing in the lab was just because someone was tracking it on their shoes or whatnot, or leaving a door open and it's blowing in. What they've actually discovered, though, is that the life form has the ability to create snow, and has been doing so across the lab. They also discover not only can it create snow, but in doing so, it can basically put a new version of itself in the snow. Basically, for every bit of snow it creates, it's creating a new extension of itself. Chandra begins to fear that the life form is trying to leave the containment of the lab. The being once again calls for Chandra, asking, what is God? Dr. Chandra. Yes. What is God? Chandra does his best to answer, and the being goes quiet for several days until it finally has a response. The being says, it is we. Upon examining the snow further, Chandra discovers that in the snow, the life form has began resembling Dr. Chandra's face. Chandra is talking to another scientist throughout this entry, saying that something is wrong, that the being has become unstable, that they can't trust it anymore, and that it wants to be human. It is here that the being interrupts, and the life form shares that humans will be like it. There's a loud bang and the life form escapes containment. What are you trying to say, that these things are dangerous? Yes, yes, damn it. I'm saying that these things want to be us. No, Dr. Kendra, you will be like us. What the hell does it mean by... Go back to Carl who is rightfully terrified by what he's just heard and the implications that come with it. He plans to leave town and get help. While he's packing up his things, Darcy has come to his office. If you remember, Darcy was last seen interacting with the thing that had Stephen's face at the city council meeting. Carl begins to talk to Darcy, telling her we're leaving. We need to go get help. Carl begins to notice something's wrong with Darcy. It is then that we hear Darcy say, Thanks for the help, bud. Thanks for the help, bud. Shit! Showing that the life form has gotten to Darcy, and presumably, everyone else at the city council meeting. There's a loud gunshot, and the recording ends. Segment 13, Winter Warning. A Channel 83 emergency broadcast. This segment shows Channel 83's weather warning. 
it's going over the blizzard, what counties are going to be hit by it, as well as what to do in these events. There is a narrator that is reading out all of this until we hear a door open behind him and he is attacked. Until the current emergency is... <laughs> The life form has taken control and begins contradicting everything that the weather broadcast said to do before. Then we hear his voice, and once again, it lacks that human cadence that we all carry. We're sorry to interrupt. We're sorry to interrupt. Leave your current location. Step outside. We will return you to the snow. The storm is shelter. The storm is home. Step outside. Tonight, the storm is coming for you. You will be like us. And with that, we are on to segment 14, a video recording of Carl Denby. We learned that Carl's fine after having shot Darcy to escape in segment 12. However, he is now alone, out in the snow, using the camera from way back in segment 2. He is now wandering alone to the frozen wasteland that is now Fawn Circle. He is looking for anyone that can help, anyone to give him shelter, and yet the city is now a ghost town with no one in sight. As he's walking, tornado sirens can be heard overhead. He hurries his pace and begins to run, sensing the urgency of the situation. However, things have caught up to Carl. He freezes in place and turns around to see a snowman with a human face on him. It opens its eyes and says you will be like us. You will be like us. Shit, 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 shit! Carl screams as he is attacked and the camera cuts to black. Segment 15 is simply the epilogue. There were very few survivors of Font Circle, and those that did survive had no idea of what actually went down. They knew nothing of the scientists or the lab at Scott's Manor, certainly nothing of the life form or why everyone disappeared. The survivors were relocated as Font Circle had so much damage to its infrastructure from the snow that it was unlivable. When the snow finally melted, all that was found was a few bits of human remains. Not nearly enough to account for the entire town disappearing. It seems as though the life form had melted along with the snow. What the investigators could never quite figure out is why the life form had never left Fawn's circle, as it just stayed there for the winter, melted, and seemingly died. However, they believe this has something to do with it unable to leave the area due to the radio waves that allowed it to communicate and move. On top of that, the University of Minnesota the university that supposedly funded the experiment at Scott's lab said that they had no idea of the experiment that went on and had no involvement with it whatsoever, denying any probable link to them. Almost a year later, on December 11th, 1983, a broadcast is interrupted once again, and we can tell it's from the life form. It seems as though it has come back with the cold. But then, there's an April Fool's message that pops up reminding all of us that the series was uploaded on April 1st. Now, as kind of funny as that ending is, um, I don't think it takes away from the story at all. I think that if you like Analog Horror, this series is well worth checking out. It's just a little bit over an hour long, and I'll drop it gladly in the description. The team did an excellent job making this, so now that we have all 15 episodes out of the way, I think we can now look at the timeline of events that transpired in the universe of Winter of 83. Now, it's worth noting, I took a lot of notes during this. I have an 18-page sheet of notes, which I'm sure to actual YouTubers is nothing for a series this big. Uh, but for me, uh, that's a lot of notes. But it'll give us a whole picture of the world of Winter of 83. In 1901, Font Circle is established. In 1968, Scott Manor closes for renovations. 1975, the Spencer Sheridan Foundation opens. This is the company that runs local television stations like K83FM or Channel 83. In 1979, Dr. Chandra is reported missing. In September of 1982, the University of Minnesota scientists rent out Scott Manor to help renovate as well as perform their science experiments. On the 14th of September, 
the lab at Scott's Manor is being finished up for Project Frozen Rain. On the 17th of September, Dr. Chandra reports that contact has been made with the life form and they can communicate properly. In November, doors and windows were put up at Scott Manor as part of the renovations. December. On December the 12th, the scientists discovered that the being grows exponentially in the cold. On the 27th, Dr. Chandra returns from Christmas vacation to learn that the life form has asked questions about human thoughts and blood. They have discovered that the life form has an ability to manipulate and influence ultra high frequency bands and magnetic media. The life form begins creating snow in the labs. On the 30th, Chandra becomes paranoid about the entity and its creation of the snow, feeling that it is trying to escape. The life form asks, What is God? and then does not speak for several days. 1983, January. On the 2nd, the life form finally responds and says it is we, and Chandra discovers that he could see his own face in the snow that the life form created. Chandra tries sharing his fears with the other scientists who disagree with him and feel that he is worried about nothing. The entity then breaks containment. On the 3rd, a broadcast interruption at Channel 83 shows various strange images before cutting to the scientists asking for help at Scott Manor. On the 4th, Vivian, Greg, and Sheriff Douglas investigate Scott's Manor to see what happened with the signal hijacking the night before. A city council meeting is held in which Channel 83 is turned down for a stimulus and broadcast interruptions are present throughout. The meeting is cut short due to the developments at Scott Manor and Darcy and P.I. Carl meet and conduct their first interview about Darcy's brother Stephen though the audio gets corrupted. That night, Channel 83 is hijacked and shows the death of a videographer during a late night movie. On the 5th, Carl interviews Darcy again and shares that he thinks he found Steven's abandoned car on the side of the road. Channel 83 shows a commercial for SIDS and through one of the broadcast hijackings, we see one of the workers gets attacked by the life form. On the 6th, Carl finds out that all but one of the police officers, Deputy Blair, have gone missing. He goes to Scott's Manor to discover all of the police who went and died there. He gathers a cassette and video camera and finds a scientist buried in the snow in the basement without legs and discovers that Stephen Milbanks has become one of the things. He is warned that they are coming in the snow by the scientist. The city council gets blocked in their meeting by the snow. Carl makes it back to his office but is snowed in. He listens to the tapes, but is interrupted when his window is broken. He flees to one of the neighboring offices, though sees several of the tapes are destroyed as the snow blows in. That night at 11 p.m., there is a Channel 83 broadcast interruption during the infomercial for the Medicine Lake campgrounds. The people at the city council meeting have now got the generator up and running, but they are snowed in. Detective Boyer manages to find a way in through the window and reveals that he has been chased here by the things and they need to barricade the exits. The thing possessing Steven walks in and attacks the citizens. On the 7th, Carl reviews the rest of the tape and decides to leave the town in order to get help. The life form imitating Darcy shows up and tries to attack Carl, to which he shoots it. An emergency broadcast is interrupted by the life form, who attacks the broadcaster and tells everyone to go outside and become one with the snow. Carl has been running through the snow after shooting the life form that attacked him in his office with Darcy's face. Storm sirens blare out as the life form attacks him. The following day, rescuers came, but only a small amount of people survived, though they knew nothing of the life form or what really happened, only that there was a big storm. They were forced to move. The University of Minnesota denies any involvements in the experiments in Scott's Manor. When the snow melted, so too did the life form, leaving behind little bits of human remains. On December 11th, a broadcast at Channel 74 is interrupted by the life form. Though this part is debatable if it's canon or not, given the April Fool message. So that is a complete breakdown and analysis of Winter of 83. Once again, I thought this series was awesome. There will be a link to it down in the description, and I really hope this analysis implores you to go check it out yourself, as it is criminally, criminally underrated. I know it's still relatively new, but please go give it some views and some likes, as I think the series was wonderfully done. And I figure what better a series to watch while it's cold outside? 
so please go check it out it's great you'll love it if you liked this video you'll love it that is pretty well all i have to say for today um this video took a good while to film so i'm going to just wrap it up so i can get to editing um so i can get it out for you guys as soon as possible so i really hope you all enjoyed it um i really hope you enjoyed the series too please go check it out but yeah if you liked the video um feel free to like comment subscribe all the typical youtuber stuff that they tell you to do um yeah i hope everyone has a great day thank you for watching